all for coming and spending your afternoon with me here. I appreciate it, and thank you for the invitation as well. Um, so I'm going to start by kind of giving you a brief overview of the discipline of biology education research. What is it? How is it different than the general discipline of education? Um, and then really dive into some of the evidence that has been collected that supports what we call evidence-based practices, right? So um, I'm going to briefly introduce you to kind of the need for this evidence and then talk to you about two approaches. One is the meta-analysis that Jen mentioned, and then another is looking at replication studies across different contexts using the same specific intervention. Okay. So just to kind of orient you, I'm going to talk about bioed research, but we can think about any disciplinary education research kind of follows the same pattern. So I'm a bioed researcher, um, so I investigate both fundamental and applied aspects of teaching and learning, or learning in the context of biology, and I'm specific to that context. So practitioners um, of this will have a deep disciplinary knowledge, and so has, as Jen mentioned, I was trained um, as a behavioral ecologist, evolutionary biologist, um, have my PhD in biology, um, and what, over the course of my PhD, I realized I was very interested in teaching, but I loved research as well, and so I found this field that kind of married both of them, right? So I have some formal training in education. It came a little later. It came through my postdoc, right, um, as well as this deep disciplinary so we can think of deeper discipline-based education researchers generally as both interdisciplinary and applied to a particular context. So we have our deep skills in our core science discipline, right? And we focused, and this is why it's applied, we focus on a context. So I focus on biology learning environments, right? But I bring with me knowledge of a bunch of different fields thus the interdisciplinary that I can apply in this context, right? So I read in cognitive science, education, educational psychology, social psychology, sociology, all of those have ideas that can impact our classrooms, right? And how we manage our classrooms and how we think about approaching students in our classrooms, as well as in other learning environments. Okay. Um, so my context, just to introduce it briefly, I work at Florida International University um, it's a public R1. It's the largest Hispanic-serving institution in the U.S. And as part of my work there, I really focus on um, how to reduce inequalities in students' experiences by partnering with faculty, right? So one person in the department isn't enough, right? It's the partnerships and it's the relationships we form with people teaching that impact what we do in our universities as a whole. So a lot of my work focuses around interventions to address inequalities. So I've done a lot of work around teaching methods that can reduce inequalities, um, student motivation, so how differences in motivation and differences in what motivates students are important, and knowing those and knowing how to leverage those in the classroom can really make a difference. Um, so thinking about what is driving student, a student to come to college? What are their interests? What are their career goals? How confident are they, right? All of these different things impacts how they'll interact in a learning environment, right? It impacts their success and, and things like that in the learning environment. So I need to think about what the students bring with them as well as what my institution is providing, right? So kind of marrying those two inputs is, is where I like to situate myself. So today I'm really going to focus on teaching methods, but I'm happy to talk to you about any of these other things afterwards or with questions. But what I want to talk about is how we teach and does how we teach matter. So we're going to start with this. So I'm going to show you a bunch of statements on the next slide, and I want you to, on your own, so no talking, right, um, take 30 seconds, read through them, Tell me, well, think about what the commonalities are with these statements. Right? So there's also a screen in the back if you can't read what's in the front. All right, so just read through them quietly. Think about what they all have in common.
ready, go ahead and turn to your neighbor, if you have a neighbor, and uh, see if you came up with the same thing, right? What are the commonalities that you all see in these statements? So about 10 more seconds, try to wrap up your thoughts. <laughs> oh, you're good, you're good. All right, does someone, would someone be willing to share what one of the commonalities they thought was there? Sure. They're all from the point of view of the faculty. They haven't asked us. They're all from the point of view of the faculty? Yeah. What else? Their beliefs and feelings, not data-driven. Their beliefs and feelings, right? Yeah. So the faculty members' beliefs and feelings about what they're doing. It seems like pretty confident. Like, I just know that someone's uh, yeah. really strong. So they're confident in their beliefs and feelings? Yeah. yeah, yeah, from the perspective of the faculty. Yeah, and I guess one of the things I want to point out is some of these are from conversations. Some of these are from published papers, right? So that's, that's interesting. That's not something necessarily you would see in other contexts, right? So we're seeing all these belief statements. And I do want to acknowledge, and I think it's important to acknowledge, that teachers do use personal observation. Teachers do use personal knowledge powerfully in the classroom, right? So every day I'm making a decision about, do my students get it enough that I can move on, right? And so there is value to these sorts of things. But when you're trying to generalize, when um, national agencies are trying to tell us what right, the methods we should be adopting, this is probably not the quality of the evidence that we're going for, right? So we probably need a little bit more rigor if we want to generalize, right? So the point here is, again, this is all personal evidence, which has value in contexts, but we might need to be a little more rigorous. Another reason that we need to think about this is reproducibility, right? So a lot of fields are wrestling with reproducibility Psychology had a pretty recent kind of crisis with this, right? Where they, um, they actually they had a really cool system. They had a group of um, folks across the nation that created a collective that agreed to try to replicate each other's studies, right? Which is actually a pretty amazing endeavor. But what they found is that only about a third to a half of the original findings were ever able to be replicated, right? So if we're thinking about oh, this worked in my classroom, right? Is it going to work in other people's classrooms, right? So with this replication problem is also another reason that we need to think about rigor in education. And so right now, what we're seeing in education, which is also true, again, in most disciplines, is novelty is valued over replication, right? So you're going you're gonna to get a study that's new published much more readily And so actually less than 1% of educational articles even attempt to be replications. But if we want to make generalizable claims, we probably need to be replicating our studies. Okay. So today I really want to talk to you about two approaches to kind of educational rigor and thinking about educational studies in a rigorous way. So one is a meta-analysis. So I'm going to talk to you about this meta-analysis in the context of active learning generally. But another is really thinking about replication across different contexts, right? So can one specific type of active learning work at a community college, at an R1, at a comprehensive university? What needs to change, right, to get it to work? Those sorts of things. Those sorts of replication studies are going to be really important for understanding what can actually transfer out of a context. So those are the two things I want to talk with you today about. So let's start with the meta-analysis. Okay. 
so just to give you a quick definition, it's a quantitative statistical analysis of separate but similar studies in order to test the pooled data for statistical significance. So the first thing you might notice out of this is that we're not doing the studies, right? We're going out into the literature, we're collecting the studies. And so, oops, um, I'm going to talk to you about the criteria we used to do that, but evidently that is not the next slide. So the first thing when you start a meta-analysis that you need are definitions, right? You need to know what you're looking for, what's your control, and what's your treatment group. And so we um, actually asked faculty um, to write down on cards what, what active learning was to them. So coming up with these characteristics of active learning um, at multiple seminars. So we had a big stack, and these are the themes that came out of those conversations. So for most faculty, active learning engages students in the process of learning through activities and or discussions in class. It also came out that it often emphasizes higher order thinking skills, so analysis, application, right, think about case studies, um, evaluation, those sorts of things. And a major element was that it involved group work. All right, so that was our working definition for the purpose of this meta-analysis of active learning. So if we saw those elements in an intervention, we considered it an active learning study. The control then was what we're calling the traditional lecture. And that was where, for the length of the entire class, right, students are listening to an expert talk, right? So they may be taking notes, um, but they're not talking themselves, right, and engaging in that way, except maybe once in a while when they raise their hand with a question, right? So those were our definitions, our working definitions for this paper. Right. So finding the studies. So what we did here is we hand-searched 55 STEM education journals from 1998 to 2010, we queried online databases, we mined bibliographies, and then we did a snowballing check where um, we checked the citations and all the publications that we pulled to make sure that we covered everything, right? And so by doing that, we found 642 published studies in the literature across all of STEM on active learning, comparing an active section to a passive section. But we also have to think about quality of the studies themselves, um, because we want to analyze similar studies, right? So we can't just pool everything together. So we had to think about what our criteria were here. And so we had seven criteria. I'm just showing you three of them. But for example, some people, um, when they did interventions, they would change a recitation or they would change some voluntary um, outside of class activity. We didn't include those. We only included when the instructors changed the class sessions themselves. Um, there had to be some sort of data on academic performance. Um, and we focused on this because we thought it would be most persuasive to faculty, right? So you could collect um, data on how much students like it, you, and, and you should, right? That's an element of this too, they are a voice. Um, but in thinking about this and thinking about what would be most impactful, we focused on performance. Um, and so that performance could have been on exams, it could have been on concept inventories, which are just kind of almost short quizzes that are focused on one topic. Um, and we also did analyses of failure rates, which included any time students got a D, an F, or withdrew from the course, right? So if we were measuring achievement, um, the last criteria I just want to point out is that the assessment had to be equivalent in both treatments. If So that meant either they were identical assessments or the folks had created a pool of questions and they randomly chose from that pool to create the assessments for each treatment. Um, that way someone can't turn around and just say, oh, they made the exam easier, right? which is an argument that I've heard before. So we wanted to make sure that that wasn't an easy argument to make against the people. So there are four more criteria such as that. Once we went through our criteria, we actually only ended up with 225 studies. So the majority of the studies didn't actually meet these criteria. And this 
anyone who does a meta-analysis runs into this. There are studies that don't even report the standard deviations or underestimates. There's just, you can't work with some of the papers. Right. So I also want to point out that this was a super collaborative effort. Um, it was led by Scott Freeman. My role on this was actually doing the analyses. So I ran the meta-analysis. All of these folks read those 642 papers. Um, and then I just came in when there needed to be a tiebreaker, and I got to focus on, on doing the stats, which was, I think, the easier part of the job. All right, so here's our first question. Does active learning increase student performance on assessment across STEM disciplines relative to traditional lecture? So I want to orient you to this graph, and again, it's in the back if you can't see the one on the front very well. But the first thing you might notice is what you expect to be on the x-axis is on the y, right? So the disciplines are on the y-axis, and the outcome variable, which is our hedges g, is on the x-axis. So hedges g is an, a measure of effect size, and it's basically the mean in the treatment minus the mean in the control divided by the pooled standard deviation, right? So if it's above zero, treatment did better, right? If it's below zero, the control did better. But what's also important here is to focus on, okay, let me introduce this. So here's what you're gonna see. You're gonna see a dot and a bar with some numbers. So the dot is the estimate of the effect size. The bar, oh, the numbers are the number of studies in that discipline. So of the 252 studies, that's how many was in, say, engineering. The bar is the 95% confidence interval around that estimate. And so the key thing to pay attention to here is whether or not that bar crosses the zero line. If it doesn't pass the, cross the zero line, then there's a statistically significant difference between the treatment and the control, basically. And if it does, there's not. Right? So I'm gonna put the data up here, and again, I'm gonna ask you to turn to your neighbor and answer this question. If you, you might be able to see it better by turning around in the back, right? So, here's the data. So go ahead and try to answer this question. What do you see? And I'm gonna use my phone as a timer and not check the text. So about 10 more seconds, try to wrap up your thoughts. interval does overlap with most of them, so can't say that definitively. No, I can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what else? It's, I mean, it's hard to say a whole lot about geology and computer yep. science because they have such a small number of studies. Yes. And so that could possibly be why we see them falling on the other side of the zero. Yeah, so anything that has a sample size basically under 10 yeah. is spanning those lines, right? So we kind of need more studies there. Yeah. What else? Please. Well, I mean, you just 
like breaking down things between discipline can be interesting, but if you're just looking at the effect of active learning, yeah. it's clear. Yeah. That, uh, Yes, so we did an analysis to see if any of these disciplines were different from each other, a heterogeneity analysis, and they were not. And so that allowed us to pool all the studies to this overall value here, which is bounded away from zero on the positive side, right? Yes, please. Where are the other 100 studies that being 250? Yeah, so good question. So those 252 included the ones that were failure rate, and these are just exam performance. Yeah. So Thank we'll you. get to the other set. Yeah. You actually can't, it's not as satisfying, but you can't actually add them up to the whole because some studies actually presented multiple instances, and so those would be analyzed separately in here as well. But yes, you'll see the DFW studies. Please. Can, can you describe what the standard deviation is? I'm just curious. So it's, it's an improvement, but. Is it the difference between like an A and a B, or is it different yep. between like C and C plus? Yep. Well, yeah, that's actually actually what we'll do exactly next. So let me do that. So we see about a half a standard deviation improvement, right, between the active learning section and the traditional lecture classes, right? But what does that mean? So putting the results in context, the. What that means is going to differ by class. It depends on your standard deviation and your classes, right? But to try to get a general sense, we collected standard deviations on exam performance from multiple years of three introductory STEM courses, chemistry, biology, and math, all right? And so what we found, at least at the University of Washington, is a half a standard deviation was a 6% increase on exams, or a 0.3% or 0.3 increase in course grade, so from a B to a B plus, or a C plus to a B. But again, it depends on what the standard deviations are on your exams in the course of this. But that was trying to give us a little bit of a test. There was another question. Yeah. Did you look at what type of class it is relative to the study? So for example, in biology and physics, you expect to have courses that have a laboratory component, which mm -hmm. apparently is more active than, say, math lab? So we. Um, that's a good question. Do I remember that? Um, I don't remember what we did with the lab section. So I'd have to look back at the paper. So I apologize for that. But that is something interesting. But if it was there, I think the important thing is that it didn't change between the treatment and the control. So if it was there in the control, it has to be there in the treatment. Otherwise, it's a different study, right? So they're probably in there, but it should be the same across contexts. Um, if there was a change in the lab, we would have thrown that out, right? If there was a change other than the classroom practices. Yeah. Yep. Um, another thing is that we can't, I mean, we're pooling all the different types of active learning here, right? So that's another thing we'd be asking about, right? Are some more effective than others? And we can't answer that with this by the design of the study. Any other questions on this? All right, so then let's look at D's, F's, and withdrawing from the course, so DFWs. So this is a different outcome uh, variable. This is the percent decrease in failure rate, which is going to just be failure rate in the control minus failure rate in the treatment. So if it's positive, there was higher failure rate in the control than the treatment. Okay, so here's what we see here. So here, I actually think this is kind of amazing. So even though our numbers are much smaller, um, we get a pretty significant difference, right, between the two. Yep. How do you compare it to your traditional lecture? What does that mean? We are trusting that the, whatever the author said was active learning is active learning. So when we went into the articles, what we found is that people weren't really describing what they were doing, right? Or if they were describing what they were doing, it wasn't in enough detail that we could actually char characterize it. So we had to trust that when the instructor said, this was the control and this is the treatment, that that, that was true. So there's actually, I'm mean, really excited, there's a follow-up meta-analysis happening on 2010 and onward that because the standards of reporting have increased, gotten better, you can actually tell what people were doing in the classroom, and so they're going to be able to parse a little bit more of that out. Yeah. But right now, we were relying on the authors. Yep. 
So what we he see here is a risk difference of about 12%. So active learning reduced the failure rate by about 12%. So here in the traditional class, the average failure rate was about 34%, and in the active learning class, the failure rate was 22%. Another way to think about it is that students were 1.5 times more likely to fail in the traditional course than in the active learning course. Just to put that in a little context. So there aren't Please. any psychology? Percentages? Not that measured DFW. Mm -hmm. They only did the, the um, academic tests. Yeah. So people measure this a lot less than you can see the numbers. But this is almost the bottom line and what a lot of people care about is like are our students moving on. Right. All right, so then the question that you always have to ask with a meta-analysis is publication bias, right? So we all know that it's easier to publish positive results, right? Results that show a difference. So there's a suite of tests you can do to look for publication bias. Um, one is to drop the studies with the biggest effects on either end because those are the ones that are most likely to get published and could have a skewed effect on our overall findings. And then recalculate your overall effects. So we did that and it was statistically indistinguishable from what we originally found. Um, we calculated, this is the one I find most compelling, we calculated the number of studies with an effect size of zero that we would have to find in the literature um, to lose our effect, right? And so for achievement, it was 114 studies. If we had found basically half again our sample size that didn't work, we would have lost that effect. Um, but for the DFW, we would have had to have found 438 studies, which is like, what, four times our sample, right? So that's, that's pretty impressive. It would take a lot to lose that effect. So that was pretty compelling. Um, and then the last thing we did was check whether one or two influential studies were driving our effect. And so we dropped each study, re-ran the analysis, saw if it, if it changed our outcomes, and we found no evidence that any one study was influencing our outcomes. So overall, from the meta-analysis, we really saw that across STEM, there's support that active learning increases performance and decreases failure rates. Um, and it seemed to be pretty robust to publication bias. Those numbers were pretty impressive compared to other meta-analyses that I've seen. So that was really exciting. And with this came out, it got a lot of press, right? So uh, well, A, I, we didn't come up with that title. That was a journalist. <laughs> Um, but it got press in academic spaces. It got press um, in both national and international public spaces. And my fave, uh, the one time in my life I'm going to trend on Reddit, we got up to number three. We beat out the Pope baptizing aliens. <laughs> but we did not beat out David Bowie. So, but it was pretty exciting, right? And it seemed, this paper really seemed to fill a need. People were looking for something that brought the evidence together, right? Because individual studies are all, all, all studies have a little bit of flaws, right? But when you look at the preponderance of the evidence, what do we see? And that's what this meta-analysis did for folks. But I also want to problematize this a little bit and talk about the type of studies that were in the meta-analysis. So, first of all, most of these studies were done at selective R1s. The majority of the students at these institutions were white Americans. Um, we looked at instruction as a binary when we know, right, it's not yes, no, it's a range. How much are you doing, right? Uh, we pooled across all types of active learning. And so given these things, and, and anything that you're thinking about, what are what is the information that you would like to know to really be con convinced about active learning, right? So what do you need, what additional information would you like to conclude that active learning works for all students? So go ahead and talk to each other for like a minute and then I'll see what, what y'all are thinking about. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
About 30 more seconds, make sure everyone's had a chance to talk. About 10 more seconds, try to wrap up your thoughts. All right, let's come back together, and I'd love to have um, someone start us off by sharing what, what they still want to know. I'm not going to be offended. Let's, I, I mean, the definition that you gave in the beginning for active learning was still fairly vague. Like, I'd yep. like to know, see the different techniques listed out. So what are the different techniques that folks are using and, and which are more effective, right? So I can't say, so we did this preliminarily and then we just didn't feel confident enough in our calls to include it in the paper. But the technique that seemed to have the strongest effect was one that I think a lot of us would not consider using. It was called the hot seat. And they brought a student up to the front of the class and just threw questions at them. Um, so thinking about achievement, yeah, I'd be studying for that class, right? But I may never want to take another class like that yeah. again, right? So thinking about achievement, but there's also other aspects, right, that we're, we need to think about before we decide something's effective. Um, so yeah, thinking about what are all the techniques and which ones are more effective? And which ones do students not want to <coughs> drop out of school when you're using them? Yeah. Yes. I'm curious if there's any content or curriculum or courses that lend themselves to lecture as a better style. So, so far we've seen that agile learning is always better, but is that true? Yeah. So getting more specific into, this was pretty broad, so thinking about. Thinking about breaking down like a content, okay. specific content or content delivery. Yeah, so breaking down content. And when we I guess I should emphasize this too. When I say active learning, I don't mean that there's no lecture happening. The lecture, you know, some people do, right? All kind of problem-based learning. Other folks lecture a little bit and then um, use active learning as well. Um, and there is definitely evidence that storytelling in the beginning of a unit or at the beginning of a textbook chapter is actually where most of this research has been done provides the relevance and the context to excite students to get through the material, right? So there's value, there's timing too, right? So breaking down the content, breaking down timing, um, when is lecture maybe still effective? Yeah. Yeah, not throwing everything out if some of it works, right? What else? Please. Are the changes to the DFW rate actually due to changes in student learning, or is it really due to changes in faculty perception maybe uh, the way grades are assigned, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So how much is the learning changing versus the grading scheme is changing? Yeah, please. I don't know how to actually put this, but something about when novelty wears off. You see an effect because something is new and exciting to the group versus now this is just norm. And so you're no longer seeing the Yeah, so when, you, when you're talking about the group, are you talking about Instructors or the students? Um, mostly the students. Okay. 
So if it becomes common. Now what happens? Right? I would actually, I mean, my gut prediction is that if it becomes common, they're going to do better because they've learned those norms and can get into it faster without having to do the learning curve of active learning. But we don't know. There, I don't think those studies have been done. Yeah, there was another hand. We're well, going to say to that point, looking at the results across the types of students. Mm -hmm. So we point out these are R1 institutions. Yep. What students have probably been interacting with active learning, performing at the age. That's probably not true. Mm -hmm. So who does this work for, right? Yeah. One more? Just like getting back to kind of the, you know, motivation, like yep. the hot seat, that's yep. the motivation versus actually comprehending. Um, it might be interesting to know, like, are these courses for, for non-majors? You know, yep. biology for non-majors. Yep. We do that analysis. I don't think we had enough sample size to do that comparison. We did do upper and lower level, and we did do small versus large. Uh, we saw that active learning had a larger effect in small classes than in large, but all of them were still significant. Um, and we saw, I believe we saw no difference between upper and lower. But no, we didn't, I don't think we looked at majors versus non-majors. But if so, you know, a lot of these active learning courses require students to do stuff outside of class, and if the motivation isn't there to do that, right, is that, is that a challenge? And where is the motivation to be hired? Right, so there's a lot of work, I guess my point, still to be done, right? And that's, that's exciting, because it means I'm gonna have a job forever, right? <laughs> um, but it also, brings out that this is not the be all end all, right? This is a way of bringing data together and it created a cohesive picture, but we lose nuance when we do it, right? Can I ask one question? Please. Like, we all looking at their student success in terms of the number, but how much student enjoyed actually actively yep. learning versus the yep. actually stay at home and not show up for Yeah, so enjoyment. So the attitudinal kind of stuff. Yeah. And there's work being done on that. And I think one, I think one of the, there was recently a paper that just came out um, by Charles Henderson showing that on average, teaching evaluations don't go down, which I think speaks to that enjoyment factor, that at least it's not um, different. That doesn't mean it, it doesn't for individual folks, but on average, we don't see that deeper, which is also good news. How many of these were funded? Of the experiments? Yeah. Um, I do not. I do not. Let's go back to your, where you started with the psychology replication yep. of yep. half to a third. Yep. I've always wondered how much of it is dependent upon resources and infrastructure and years yep. of planning right. as opposed to right. just setting it out. Yeah. So I think that's another one of the exciting things about this follow up meta analysis is that now that active learning is being adopted more broadly, it's not just these, which is actually what I thought maybe your point had been, it's not just the first adopters who were like super excited about it and sinking a lot of time. Now it's a lot of folks with a range of time trying these things. And so do we see different patterns with that? Maybe they're not coming in with as many resources. Things like that. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of open questions, right? But yeah, specific, right? And instead of this overall yes, no, we can ask more nuanced things that actually are probably going to be more valuable. So one of the, the things that I wanted to go into next is this idea of, like we said, active learning. That is a very broad generalization, right? And so what people are doing are actually really specific things. And so I wanted to talk about one of the ways we can implement active learning, a method called high structure, and thinking about it in different contexts, right? So if something works at my institution, it works in my classroom, does that really tell you whether it's going to work in your classroom, right? And so if we don't do these replication studies across context, we can't actually definitively say those sorts of things. All right? But this gives us support for the idea of transfer, if we can see it working in different contexts. Right. So in 2012, uh, Scott Freeman published a paper that described something that he called high structure. 
And it had three main elements. First, he added outside of class assignments. He added a daily graded reading quiz that really was at the definition and comprehension level of the textbook content. So really making sure that students came in knowing the critical definitions and the critical concepts. Right? The next thing that he added was a weekly practice exam. So this actually was at the level that he was going to ask on the exam. So usually it was application level, um, and it was review over what they had done that week. Then he added increased student engagement in class. So because they were doing this work outside of class, he now spent 60% of class time with students solving problems related to the content. And that, again, was usually at the um, an analysis or application level. And they were graded for correctness. Now, there can be, there's definitely a debate about participation versus grading for correctness, but, but Scott always graded for correctness. So this is one way to think about active learning, to increase the structure of the course, right? To have preparatory assignments, review assignments, and then student engagement in class. So what they found when they did this is that it increased student performance on exams and reduced the achievement gap in these biology classrooms. Okay. So questions started rising though, right? Could this work for other instructors or was there something special about this instructor, right? I don't know if you've heard that argument, but I've heard it before. Oh, but that was them. They can do that, I can't, right? So to parse that out, we need to replicate. Could this work at other institutions, or was it just the students at this institution that it could work for, right? Again, to parse that out, to see how generalizable it is, we need to replicate. So, with your neighbor, think about these things. We talked about um, reading quizzes, preparatory assignments, we talked about these practice exams that reviewed class, and we talked about active learning. Why do you think those changes could influence student performance? Why do you think they led to greater achievement? What are they doing for the students? help students, I'd love to hear it. Please. So I said it reminded me, I, I taught middle school and high school for a number of years, and so I said it reminded me sort of of like the flipped classroom idea, where we're requiring things to be done prior to kids coming to class, and but we're doing, I mean, I know that we're requiring kids to do things prior to coming to class anyway, but they don't, aren't help, the same accountability isn't yeah. there, right? So the test, the little quiz requires them to take that, and it's part of your grade. <laughs> Um, just because so much emphasis on grades. Uh, so I, like that's what this reminded me yeah. of. So creating an accountability structure for them yeah. to come in every class having looked at the textbook or at least Googling the definitions yeah. ahead of time, right? They're engaging with the concepts you want them to engage with ahead of time, right? Because you created accountability. 
And then you have more time in class yeah. to answer the questions that they're struggling with. Yeah. Yeah. So kid, sending kids home not knowing how to do things and asking them to then continue to do them isn't going to get them anywhere. So students are really good at memorization, right? So letting them do that part on their own and then coming in with the application and the analysis, the part that they need a mentor for, right? And doing that in the classroom. Yeah, so that's a great hypothesis for writing support. Do folks have others? Please. Really learning how to study on most like high high mission level, especially for like intro level courses and, and especially in sophomore year courses. Yeah, so by seeing, like with the practice exam questions that, oh, the way I studied, I didn't do very well in that practice, but doing it when it's not high stakes, right? So this whole time they're engaging with this idea of how to study. Yeah, great. How about another one? Please. Well, in terms of the practice exams, they're learning how to take these things. Yeah. So they know what these questions are. Yep. Yep. So they're getting exposure to the level of the question. And what's really cool, they've done a study where they did active learning that was high level, but the exams were low level. Mm -hmm. And then they reversed it and had the class at low level, but the exams were high level. And students learned to the level of the exams, not what was going on in class, right? So by showing them the level you're expecting of them all the way along, they're learning the level that they have to study. Great. So those are all like very reasonable hypotheses. And we had some similar ones too. We thought that maybe this structure helped them employ the best practices for learning. So, and I heard up front someone say this too. It forces the students to distribute their learning, right? Instead of cramming, you're structuring it so they're engaging with the content each week. And that we know that is much better for memorizing and memory than distributed learning. The testing effect is another really cool one. So the testing effect is that every time you're tested on something, you get better at it. Even if you got the question wrong, you're more likely to get it right the next time, right? So the testing effect could also be in play here. And if you're interested in these things, these books and this article are really great resources around this. Um, really talking about small things you can do in class that impact learning. Um, the in-class practice gave them this chance to really explain the materials to themselves and to others. And this has been shown to be a really robust practice um, for learning. So they're putting it in their, in the, into their own words. They're putting it into their own mental frameworks, right? So instead of my words, they have their words. So these were some of the ideas we had. And so, you know, with this, we could think about what the critical elements are. So are the reading quizzes really important, right? Or could you drop those, right? Are the practice exams really important, or could you drop those? Because no one who adopts a practice does it exactly the same as the original person, right? So identifying your theoretical framework for why it works, and then identifying your critical elements help you know what can be dropped and what needs to stay, right? So our our critical elements, we thought, were these three pieces. Um, so we recruited instructors from different institutions and different contexts to, to join with us in the study. They had to commit to trying for three years. Um, and so we got three folks on board, and we were, were really appreciated of them. An R1, a community college, and a comprehensive university. So at the R1, they added a prep assignment and then the in-class engagement. At the community college, they added the prep assignment, which is like the reading quiz. And um, at the comprehensive university, they added all of them. All right. So what we found at the R1, which was a different R1 than ours, obviously, is that um, adding the prep assignment and the engagement increased everyone's performance and it reduced the achievement gap between her white and black students. At the community college, by adding that prep assignment, she was already doing active learning, she just added the reading quiz essentially, she's found a 5% increase on their exam performance, but no effect on achievement. 
At the Comprehensive University, it was a little more complicated of a story. And so I'm going to take you through that as kind of the final thing today. Um, but I do want to just talk about some conclusions we had. And what we found is that, con not surprisingly, context matters, right? So doing exactly what the first instructor did didn't always work. But keeping true to these critical elements seemed to be important. Um, I would say that right now, we don't have the strongest evidence for the practice exams, but we have pretty robust evidence for the engagement of the assignments. So we're still working on the practice exams. Right, so let's talk about um, Dr. Ann Casper at the Comprehensive University. So when we started out, um, we added the graded review assignment, the practice exam. It was timed just like Scott did it. And what we found is that it possibly harmed the students. So it wasn't statistically significant, but it was close enough that we were all very uncomfortable, right? And so that was really worrisome. And so what we had to do is actually think about, okay, how is this context different than the one where this was developed? Um, and really go back and think about these things. So the next year, we added the online reading quizzes. We went, she went lecture free um, and still did those practice exams. The harm went away, but there was no change in their performance overall from when she wasn't doing any of these things, right? Which was really disappointing for Anne because she put a lot of time into it. So again, we were thinking about this, and we actually ended up looking back at their SAT scores, right? And so. The average SAT score at Anne's University was lower than at the University of Washington. And so her hypothesis is that maybe the textbook wasn't approachable for these students, right? Maybe this, we needed to teach them how to read the textbook. Um, honestly, when she said that, she was like, but I can't, I can't do that, <laughs> right? So what she decided to try instead was online videos. And so instead of reading quizzes, it was uh, quizzes over the content of the videos, still doing lecture free, still doing the practice exams. And at that point, we started to see an increase in exam performance. Um, so we replicated that for two more years and found an overall 3% increase on exams for all students. The effect on the failure rate was kind of astounding, so it, and Anne was really proud of this. It reduced the failing rate of URM students, or the risk of that from 73% to 34%. Um, so context matters, right? What worked at the University of Washington didn't necessarily work without modifications in this novel context. So what did we learn from this? We found that overall, adding especially the in-class engagement and the preparatory assignments, increased achievement at two R ones at community college and at comprehensive university but not without tweaking it, right? We're still not sure about the review assignments. Okay. So general conclusions here is that we have robust evidence that active learning works on average, but we need more replication of specific interventions because we need to remember that each intervention study is really an N of one. It's the classroom, not the student level, right? And so we can extrapolate from them, but we can't generalize. So if we really want to know what's going on, we have to replicate it across multiple iterations and also context, right? And if we do this, then we can disentangle the intervention from the context, and we can characterize the critical elements. Right? So doing these things are going to increase the rigor and usefulness of educational research. Um, we need to identify what can be changed in interventions, what can instructors drop and personalize, and what needs to stay there. And we need to provide examples of what works for instructors in their context to make it easier for them to adopt these methods. With that, I want to say thank you, and I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Clarification, these were all face-to-face? Yes. Courses go yep. online. Yes. So there, there has been some work with hybrids, um, which are half online, half face to face, um, that is showing that using active learning in that setting also increases yeah. performance. But I, I, I'm not familiar with the fully offline as much. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. 
Yeah, when, I, when I look at the achievement gap and the impact that the music is at the one place where it could have um, an effect uh, from classroom engagement, mm -hmm. it seems to me that maybe, you know, being able to work through a lot of misunderstanding language is important there. And then in the final study that we did where the videos help, mm -hmm. it's sort of a language thing. Yep. I'm wondering how one thinks about that from the standpoint breaking away from sort of formal textbook for maybe a large number of the population. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of things to think about. So uh, one of the instructors, Kelly Hogan, she actually does guided reading assignments where she has questions that she asks as they read that help them break things down. Like they're as specific as in figure three, what is the red whatever represent and what is the blue and it really guides them through how to read a figure and how to think about approaching a textbook so that's one way to do it but these these videos may be another way right and a lot of students uh, when they don't understand something right they're they're googling or getting on youtube and watching these things and it does seem to resonate with them they find that more approachable right maybe than the textbooks so it is i think it is uh, we were talking a little bit about how like sometimes when you get quizzes in one course that course then becomes more like you spend more time yep. on that course so i was wondering if there were any studies where there were maybe university-wide changes that were made because then that might be across all courses yeah yeah so not yet i hope those are coming but i can say with ann's class we've asked the students how much time a week they were spending on the class so it went up when they were reading the textbook but when they were watching the videos, it went back to the level it had been. So they weren't necessarily adding more time. The, our hypothesis is that maybe they were studying more efficiently at that point because they had more guidance on how to approach the content. It also yeah. do with the perception of time. Like maybe yes. it take, feels like it takes way longer yeah. to read the text. Like yes, time. absolutely. <laughs> right? Um, this was all self-report data. Yeah. Which is definitely a lot. What are the implications for faculty for so, you know, we know some things about yeah. active learning, but there's a lot we still yeah. don't know. And from your last study that you talked about, context matters. So how do we um, best support faculty in thinking about their own courses and what to incorporate? I think that's a great question. I think, and I also think this is a good, in terms of ownership, but helping them do studies on their own courses, on what they what they care about, what's important for them to change, starting there, mm -hmm. right? And, and small changes first around something they really care about is going to be a great way to kind of onboard them to the larger changes, right? Um, but I'm not, a, I mean, there are folks that study faculty change, and I'm not, I'm not one of them. Um, but I also really like the idea of the stuff that you're doing here with grad students and bringing grad students on board and helping them learn those skills early so that when they get their faculty position, they already know that stuff. And so they're making their new course, but they also aren't learning, have them learn all these methods at the same time. It's going to make you feel a lot less overwhelming. We hope. Yeah, we hope. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if you saw any correlation between active learning and uh, the engagement of students and retention in STEM and their interest and like ability to go into the more advanced degrees and become research scientists. Yeah, so long-term studies on the impacts of active learning have not come out yet. Um, I know the University of Michigan is working on one. I haven't seen it come out. Um, the places I've seen those studies are actually with course-based undergraduate research um, experiences in biology. They've shown that if students go through those courses as freshmen, at least in the context of the study, doubled their chance of retention. Um, but similar work, to my knowledge, has not been done in my We really just focus on one course, right? Is it in, in the works? Are they uh, waiting for the students to get to the graduation course? No, class? I think or it's they... a it's actually a way more complicated question than we think it is, right? Because it the context that the student then moves into after the active learning class matters, right? So what if they've learned how to do this type of learning where they're talking to each other, they're learning on their own, and then they move into a lecture class, right? Do we think that they're gonna do as well as a student who's had lecture classes all along? I don't know, right? And so the context and, and how exams are designed 
are going to have a really big effect on this. And so parsing out all those variables to try to find the effect is going to be really hard. There's a lot of noise going on, right? And the signal is probably small. If you can, I'm, I'm thinking about how you can compare across fields as yep. a way to sort of address some of the noise of the issues. Yep. And I keep thinking about what you said about teaching how to read a textbook. Mm -hmm. um, in biology education, you assume students are going to have to take a biology course because it's a reasonable assumption. Right. In engineering, you start off by teaching students that they know nothing about engineering yeah. because they probably haven't learned it yeah. And so you are teaching them how to read graphs, you're teaching yeah. them the very basics yeah. about the engineering design skill set. I wonder if there's something to compare across the fields using the techniques to try and actually correlate how much of this is reteaching students what they didn't learn right versus right. what they never learned. Right. So maybe asking them about how much, how many biology classes they had had before or the types of things they had encountered in biology classes before. Yeah. And then correlating yeah. that with their performance with an active or without. Mm -hmm. Or you're trying yeah. to figure out what it is they don't understand about the yep. textbook that they, yep. that we assume they know is not yeah. to remember, but they do know. Yeah. Yeah. Even more than just the they assume they know. Yes. They assume. Yes. Yeah. We yeah. hear that all the time. Yeah. Well, yeah. So students think they highlight, and that's effective, right? But the evidence is, unless you highlight very little, highlighting is not effective, right? So you've got to be processing as you highlight. But what I see in my students' textbooks is the entire page, right? But that's not helping them, right? And and yet it is the most common method that students list for studying, but it is like the least effective. certain active learning method where you have the same instructor, it's the same method, is applied at the same university for yeah. the same discipline, yeah. and yet you get different results yeah. just based on student population. You do. Even from term to term, not only from yeah. year to year. Yep, yeah. you do. So I wonder, you know, how how big the deviation should be yeah. that we should still say that our method works. Yeah. Like if this year I'm going to see 3% increase in exam yeah. performance versus 10% next yeah. year. Yeah. You know, it, it's still working, obviously, right. but should I maybe replace it with a more effective? Yeah. So it's yeah. really a dynamic process, it right? Is. Like you have to adapt mm -hmm. it every time to each class. Yeah. You cannot just apply right. this thing. And that's you. why, I mean, even as a baseline, I always try to collect three semesters of data, right, to try to account for mm -hmm. those variations before I even consider that we're going somewhere. But it's a bigger problem than that, right? I mean, each semester is something. So, yeah, there's variation, even within like people who are truly really effective. Some of the time. So yeah. you did see, you did see the that there's variation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, we did a intervention, for example. It wasn't one of these. It was actually the values affirmation intervention. One semester it completely closed the achievement gap. The next semester it did nothing, and the third semester it had the achievement gap. Right. So. There is variation because it's not just the active learning in the classroom. It's the instructor-student relationship. It's the student-student relationships, right? There's so many variables that it's such a complex problem that we're really reducing it by just talking about the active learning.